Allegro Spiritoso is composed by Jean-Baptiste Sonnelet. Uh, Sonnelet is a French composer and violinist who lived during the Baroque period. Now, being a violinist, this piece is a transcription. And so, of course, once again, not written for tenor saxophone. Uh, but it works really, really well, and it fits within our range very nicely. As you play through it, there's a couple of things throughout the composition that you can see kind of our idiosyncratic uh, violin kind of things, which we'll point out, especially the last major at the end. Being a Baroque composition, this is going to have a lot of characteristics of the Baroque period. And as you go through there, you're going to find a lot of sequences, okay, where the motive is repeated at a different pitch level. You're also going to find a lot of terrace dynamics, where you're very loud in one instance, and very soft the next instance, or vice versa. The tempo and character marking for this Allegro Spiritoso is Allegro Spiritoso. Okay, pretty straightforward. Allegro meaning fast, Spiritoso with spirit. Well, how do we create this spirit? Well, obviously, the Allegro tempo is going to do that for us a little bit, okay? We can go, it's marked quarter note equals 120, but we can go a little bit slower than that, 112 or so, and still have a very light character. So there's a couple technical passages that you'll have to be concerned about uh, in the tempo that you can play those, and that's going to give you a better idea of where you should start this. But remember, you've got to keep the character of the music going. If it goes too slow, it loses that, and it's not very true to the composition. Now, as you play this, once again, look at the first major. No editorial marks, okay? Nothing was probably written by the composer either. But to keep it spiritoso, what we need to do is a couple things. We need to make sure that these eighth notes are separated and that we give them a light tonguing style. Notice that the dynamic here is not very uh, loud, okay? Kind of light, but we have to put a lot of energy into that. We've got to feel excitement and put excitement into the music in that way. The other thing that's going to do it for us is when we get to the fourth major, we have a long pitch. We need to put some vibrato on there, and very fast spinning vibrato to add to that spirit. And then we're going to be very, very dramatic with our dynamics. We're going to be very, very loud. We're going to be just as excited when we play very, very soft. Okay, so we've got to put all of these things into this music to create the spiritoso. Let me first play for you the opening measures of the Allegro Spiritoso so you have a good idea what this character should sound like. phrases. Notice how the line moves up starting at about major five. But there's no dynamic written in. Well, musically, we know what to do here. You've got an ascending line that's moving up. We've got a mezzo forte. This is the goal of the musical phrase. So we want to put the inflection of crescendoing on up to the top of this and arching it and bringing it right back down. And then we do the same thing but at a different dynamic level. And by the time we get to 16, we increase that dynamic even more to a forte. And this, is what, this generates excitement. We can't play it just straight. It's got to go somewhere. It's got to do something. And we need to help it along to make it and generate that excitement. The first little technical thing I want to talk to you about occurs in the first phrase at major five. We'll notice that we have this stretch of eighth notes that is ascending up the scale. But we, they're slurred, but with a staccato at the end. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, remember, staccato means separation. It doesn't mean short. So when we play this, in order to give it the spirited, light flavor, we've got to keep a separation. Now, if we play it just as eighth notes, we get... Not very exciting, not very light at all. So what we have to do is we have to put separation between these notes. Now, basically what you're doing is you're taking that note, instead of being an eighth note, it's more like a sixteenth note or a thirty-second note when you go even faster. And what you have to do is you have to tongue the downbeats for D, E, F, G, progressing up the scale, getting louder each time. But then also what you have to do is you have to stop your air on that upbeat. Now, how do you do that? Well, take it slow. speed it up until you get comfortable stopping your air very quickly. The most 
most technically challenged part of this piece occurs over on the second page around the letter C in my part, which is major 90. And here there's a couple problems. We've got some breathing issues that really are not a problem for string players, but we also have a little bit of a technical issue that we're going to have to watch out for. Now, if you look at my markings and what I've done, first of all, notice what I've done with the phrasing and the markings. Let me play the melody for you here, starting at major 90. Now I put phrase marks in measure 94 after the G, and then again in measure 98 after the F. Because that's where the, this is a sequential pattern, you can hear how it just repeats at a lower pitch level, and that that's the goal. The problem here is that we don't get another chance to breathe until we get all the way down to 108. And it really would be helpful if we could do that. So here's what I've done, and you can see what I've done here in the score. At measure 94, after we reach that goal of G, you can see I put a phrase mark, parentheses around it, make sure to tell me not to take a breath there. But in order to facilitate the breathing, we really don't have time in measure 98 between two sixteenth notes to take a breath, but we have to finish the goal of that phrase, which is on F. So what I have done is taken a breath in measure 97 after the F. And then this will still, we can still do the phrasing over in measure 98, but we don't have to worry about trying to take a breath at that spot. Now it breaks up the phrase a little bit, but as a wind player, we just really don't have a lot of choice in, in what to do here. We need to get that breath in. Uh, now, also at measure 98, notice what I've done after the phrase. After we've reached our rival point of F, I've immediately done a dynamic change of pianissimo. And that's because he's resetting this up again over the next several measures with these long runs to move back up to the F, and it's a very, very neat effect. So if we start here at the pianissimo, notice the tonguing that's placed. Now this is a pretty hard technique, and you have to practice it. Once again, practice it very slow. We go C to D with our articulation, go to the next major, look at the last 16th note, it goes D to E, and then the last one finally goes to F. So what he's done is he's gone up through the scale. As, in, as you move through these little scale patterns and in the sequential patterns, you're building and generating energy and excitement. So when we have forte at measure 98, we've got to bring it back down to a piano or a pianissimo so that we can rebuild all of this energy and excitement. The last technical part of this, this lick that goes from 98 to 108 are the staccato piano notes in measure 106. Notice that you get terrace dynamics from measure 104, 5, and then going at measure 106, you get a soft dynamic level all of a sudden. Any further changes, this is an editorial mark, by the way, and the arranger has changed this so that you get a staccato instead of the, the slur. Now, if you can play the entire piece and you're doing really, really well with it at a good fast tempo, 116 to 120, but this particular measure is slowing you down, just change the articulation. You can change this articulation at this spot by doing exactly the same that you did in the two previous measures by doing tongue, tonguing on the downbeat and slurring the other three notes. Now it's kind of a cool effect, but you do have to practice it and be wary of it. I'm going to go ahead and play this entire section for you all the way from measure 90 to measure 108, and you can listen to all those things that we just got done talking about with the phrasing. You'll also be able to see with, with practice and taking this up to tempo that you don't necessarily need to take a breath in this section at all, making the breathing uh, discussion a moot point. Just put the phrasing in where we talked about it and it will make perfect sense. <laughs> The last part of this movement, we want to talk about the ending. Everything's going along at a very steady, very fast 120 to the quarter note, but at the end we get a rollantando on this trill. In the very last measure, this is really kind of a string device, I think. Uh, what we do is we get the descending scale going down on the D the minor scale in the second to last major down to the low D. And that low D is really finishing it. But then all of a sudden we get this D at the end. And really what we should think about this is like plucking the string of, of a, a violin. And that's really what it amounts to. I'm going to start back here at measure 126 just to go to the end. <laughs> light little tonguing and just uh, also at a different dynamic level than the low D. And I think it could be very, very effective.
Thank <laughs> you. 